dimensions of analysis, and then some conclusions. So going to the history of philosophy very quickly, <laughs> going through a couple thousand years, um, my main point is, is a, a watershed event here, uh, which divides all of theory and, and philosophy up until this point was focused on the individual mind. All of discussions of cognition were focused on the individual mind. So even Kant, um, who brought together rationalism and, and empiricism, two different, very different theories, he, he synthesized things to get one theory. And I think from Kant we get the idea that there can be one theory that's sufficient to sort of explain everything, like the unified theory in physics. And, so. um, and I'm going to argue, uh, along with the idea of multivocality, that there is no one theory. We need many theories in CSCL. Uh, and, and that's because there's this dividing line after Kant comes Hegel, who no longer focused on the individual mind, but broadened it through the look at the development uh, through history, from individual consciousness to social, um, the Weltgeist and so on, to um, a much more complex and dynamic version of cognition. And all of, all of uh, recent theory in the 20th century, I think, is based on theories of Marx, Wittgenstein, and Heidegger. Uh, Marx, of course, took a very historic, socially based view of things, also very dynamic, based on Hegel. Wittgenstein looked at language and said that cognition is based on uh, different forms of life that, that ground language. Um, so different people who are involved in different activities would have different forms of consciousness, and so you would need different forms of analysis for that. And Heidegger grounded everything in people's being in the world, their, their existence grounded in the situation. And so the social, linguistic, and uh, embodied views of cognition have been extremely influential on all, all the theories since then. Um, and so we have now a number of theoreticians that are very important within CSCL. And you can trace their theoretical roots back to this. And they all uh, come un under this line. In other words, they're all focused on um, not on individual cognition, but on something much more complex. And so my argument is that given the complexity of cognition now, uh, you need a variety of different theories. And, and that's what I want to talk about. So in terms of uh, collaborative learning, what is needed in order for collaborative learning effectively, effective collaborative, effective collaborative learning to take place? What are the conditions or the preconditions of that to take place? And in thinking about this, I thought of five different, at least five different areas of, of preconditions. So one is what's called very generally intersubjectivity. And this is a theme that pops up in philosophy, but I think has never really been um, analyzed very thoroughly at all. Um, I'm sorry, th this workshop is full. No more. <laughs> Please finish while I set up. So, um, what is intersubjectivity? Uh, and in particular for CSCL, we need to study intersubjectivity, how that's possible in online situations, which is quite different from face-to-face -face situations. All intersubjectivity means is that people are able to understand each other when they communicate. And the question is, how is that possible? If you start from the idea of individual consciousnesses, um, how, how, do they, uh, how are they conscious of the same thing? How do they understand each other? And in the history of philosophy, that was a big problem. But uh, in fact, people are very good at doing that. And there are different techniques they use, and we can study those techniques empirically. Uh, also, for collaborative learning, it's important that the group builds what people call a joint problem space. And so this is where all their shared ideas 
and the, and the shared focus of their discussion lies. And they actually build that in their discourse um, in various ways, and we can study that. And then there's the theme of, of what I call, in my writings, group cognition, which means um, how do small groups use these shared resources that they've built, like the joint problem space? How do, they, how do they use that in order to get their work done, their cognitive accomplishments, as a group? Which is quite different from the traditional view of how do individuals accomplish cognitive tasks. Um, and the answer to that that's been coming out in research is largely through discourse. People, people build their joint problem space, build their inner subjective understanding of each other, uh, and, and do group cognition through, largely through discourse. And there are a lot of uh, specific kinds of techniques that are used in discourse that one can analyze empirically and see how people are actually doing that in online situations, for instance. People make proposals to each other, they ask each other questions, they repair, uh, they request information from each other, they repair uh, when misunderstandings seem to arise, they repair the misunderstandings, they point to things, they develop symbolic representations that are shared, and so on. So we can study all of that. And then there's the question of collaborative learning. So in one sense, collaborative learning is already covered by group cognition, that's how a group learns. But then uh, people in the learning sciences always want to know how the individuals who are involved, what have they learned, too. And so that's largely, uh, at least according to Vygotsky's theory, is a matter of their, in, the individuals in the group internalizing what the group has accomplished. And so we can study that, too. Um, so there are various levels of analysis. Uh, just like Hassan said, um, we have the uh, community level, the small group level, and the individual level, and we can analyze those, and, uh, and those take different kinds of analyses. It's not that there's one theory or one method of analysis that covers all those different levels. So for instance, studying intersubjectivity in, say, a classroom or a larger community of practice, you have techniques from the social sciences, ethnography, and so on. Uh, for studying the joint problem space, you might use activity theory or actor network theory. For studying the small group level, you would use my theory, of course. Um, for the discourse, which, which would look at discourse through things like uh, conversation analysis or discourse analysis looking at the content of what's discussed. Uh, and then for the, the individual level, we have our traditional methods from psychology and so on. So within CSCL, there's this tradition, or within uh, broader, more broadly, <coughs> psychology and social psychology and so on. So uh, there's this tradition of an opposition between quantitative methods and qualitative methods. And it's so widespread that we need to deal with that. Well, I think it's a false, op a false dichotomy or opposition, and I prefer to use the term objective paradigm versus meaningful paradigm. And I, I like to use it because when you use quantitative and qualitative, qualitative people feel like you're putting them down. But with objective and meaningful, everybody feels good about it. They say, well, I'm doing objective analysis, or I'm doing meaningful analysis. So uh, it's, it's more evenly balanced. But, but mainly it comes from Habermas's theory, which is that um, people in general uh, do two kinds of things. They have pr what he calls purposive, pur purpose, pur pur purposeful, <laughs> <laughs> rational actions. And that's how we deal with things in nature, not with other people, but with things in nature. We have goals. Uh, and we pursue those goals, and we conquer nature uh, and do our accomplishments. And that's the kind of thing that uh, rational, rational theories have focused on. How do we accomplish uh, our dealings with nature? But in addition to that, we have communicative action, which is how we deal with other people. And that's ver a very different nature. And to analyze it takes a different kind of, different kinds of analytic tools and approaches. Uh, and so, 
in communicative action, we interact with people. We, we have to understand the meaning uh, that's created between us, and negotiate things, and that's where intersubjectivity comes in. So in CSCL settings, there, there's a blend of things. A, a small group has tasks they're trying to accomplish, and they also have to build their inter, intersubjective, interpersonal relationships. And so to understand what's going on in a small group, you need to understand you need to analyze both of those kinds of things, which requires different kinds of analysis. Um, so in addition to those main levels, there's also a lot of different dimensions uh, of analysis that people have engaged in within CSCL and related fields. Um, so one, there's first of all the different levels of individual small group class or communities of practice, but then there are different temporal dimensions. Some people focus on what happens in a, in a couple seconds of interaction. Some people look at longitudinal studies over years uh, and, and all things between them. And then there's just lots of different learning issues that you can focus on. And different kinds of learning issues may require different kinds of methodology. So you need multivocal, uh, if we're still using that term, there was some discussion about it whether this is still a multivocal workshop or not. But, um, <coughs> so you need different kinds of methods approaching um, approaching the, the data that you're analyzing. Um, and, and that's becoming very widely recognized. So if I look at the articles that are published recently in, a, for instance, a journal like the CSCL Journal, um, more and more articles explicitly talk about using mixed methods or multiple methods. In the series of workshops that have led up to this one, and we'll see it also later today, um, bring different methods to the same data uh, and, and, and produce a much richer understanding of that data. And so one principle that most people will agree on if you, uh, if you make it explicit is that your method shouldn't be, this is the method that I was taught in graduate school. Your method should be a method that's appropriate to your research uh, questions. So you should start from research questions. I want to understand this part of, of what's going on in this data. Um, and what, what methods would be most appropriate? M methods in plural, not just what one method, but what couple methods might be the best to get at what I'm really interested in. And people generally agree that that's a, a good uh, starting point. Also, there may be a sequence of phases um, that are going on in the data that, that you're analyzing. Uh, for instance, students in a small group might socialize at the beginning uh, to get to know each other. Then they might talk about what problem are we going to really pursue, what, what aspect of this problem are we going to do then they might get into the analysis and then they might end up with some kind of con concluding social uh, chatter. And so you might want different uh, analytic tools for those different phases of your data, whatever's uh, appropriate to that. Um, you're, you're where you had a 15 minute slot, right? So I had a 10 minute slot, 10 but minute I slot. took <laughs> advantage <laughs> of some people's So the, the point is just that uh, what we try to analyze in CSCL is so complex that it requires multiple approaches to get a, a, a full understanding of it. And so um, these, are, these are my takeaway uh, conclusions or advice to the reader. <coughs> um, so learn collaboratively in multi vocal labs. So don't think of your research as just one person pursuing one method on one piece of data. But think of how it relates to other things going on in, in a richer uh, approach of the whole lab. Um, so study the different approaches, uh, conduct iterative studies, uh, design-based. Uh, and in the end, I think, really, uh, the point is that to do, to do really um, 
more thorough CSL analyses takes a global village. It takes people really uh, uh, collaborations that might uh, ex expand across labs around the world. Uh, so my slides, my slides are available here, uh, and here is a, a paper about the theory, about the, the first slide of one philosophy. So a more detailed version of that. So, and questions? And I hand over <laughs> to Dan. Thanks, Jerry.